We've been dealing with some of the things pertaining to the, uh, the teachings of Jesus. And uh, I want to go back to uh, some of this there. So tonight, I want you to turn with me real quick. We're going to get into this. Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew yeah. chapter 5. Whoa, yes. And you guys had your, in, your Wheaties tonight. Our dear beloved sister, Tina Meredith, is sitting there. Yeah. Trying to be quiet. I saw her when she first peeked in and went out, so uh, I didn't want to embarrass her, but I couldn't pass the opportunity up either. So, anyway, thank God. All right, chapter five, verse one. Uh, this is we're going to read after this. Is going to be stuff written in red. We started off uh, last week talking about leaven. We talked about beware the leaven of the Pharisees. If you remember in the book of Matthew chapter 13, uh, the leaven of Pharisees the, and the disciples, when Jesus said that, they said, oh, uh, he knows that we forgot to bring bread. Uh, he knows everything. He said, no, it's not because you forgot to bring bread. Come on, be a little more discerning than that. It's because I'm dealing with the leaven of the Pharisees. Leaven is wrong and it's sin. It deals with things that lead you in the wrong direction. He said, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees. So to understand that, you have to know what is a Pharisee. Well, let me tell you, there's nothing about a Pharisee that is fair, you see. <laughs> nothing. There's nothing about a Pharisee that is fair, you see. So when it comes to that, they're not fair because it's all about me. I'm the righteous one. I'm the holy one. You sinner, how could you? Stuck up, arrogant, too good. Almost too spiritual to be any good to God's people. That's the Pharisees. They like when you, when they came to church, they didn't want the back row. No, bless God. They wanted the front. No, they didn't. They wanted the seats on the platform. They wanted to be seen that I'm here. Paul said in the book of, in the, uh, when he was uh, dealing with his accusations in the book of uh, Acts, he said, I'm a Pharisee. I'm the son of a Pharisee. Chief. He was a part of that until he had a true encounter with Jesus Christ. So uh, the teachings of Jesus was so filled with love and goodness, but he showed them what it was truly to come to be servants and what it was like to be with one another. So uh, we're going to read some things here in chapter five. We did a thorough, thorough teaching some years ago on what we call the Beatitudes, or I called them the blessed attitudes. And I dealt with it. It was a really a teaching on your attitude. And I used the airplane about flying. And I said, when I learned to fly uh, airplanes, when I was getting my uh, pilot license, they talked a lot about aircraft being stable. And they, called, they talked to about the attitude of the airplane. Make sure the airplane is in the right attitude. And we went through training called unusual attitudes. Now, I'm glad I went through that training because as pastoring, it's a big thing dealing with unusual attitudes. And so uh, not here. I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about when I'm out in other places preaching, you know, in the body of Christ, not coming to Peace Church. Never. Let's get this. Through. <laughs> and so uh, unusual attitudes. So what they do, they put me, uh, the uh, instructor would say, and you had to do this to pass your, your pilot's test. They'll tell you to put your hands under your, your backside and you're sitting down, you know. And so they said, close your eyes and do not track the aircraft. So that means they don't want you to say like left turn, right turn, up, down. And so the lady so I had instructors do it. When I did my pilot test. A lady up in, up in uh, the northern part of the state that did my check ride, she was like 80 years old. And I thought, this is going to be an easy, unusual attitude. And she took that airplane. I'm telling you what, she took it up. You're sitting there. She went up. I felt G-forces. Then I felt it drop, and it turned, and whatever. And what you got to do, they say, open your eyes. You got to look at those gauges, and they say, bring the airplane back to a proper attitude. Because if you don't, you'll get into a stall, you can crash. So you got to make sure the airplane's in the right attitude. So uh, you're sitting there and you're going. Whoosh, whoosh. 
So as soon as they say your airplane, you look at those gauges, you calculate. If the speed is going crazy, like it's, it's picking up speed, you say, I'm heading down. Because when you're going down, you know you're picking up speed. If the speed is bleeding off, you're thinking this thing is going to stall, you know your nose high. And uh, so you have got to realize, am I going to pull back on the throttle? I'm going to give it the throttle. Because the key is, if the airplane is not in the right attitude, you're in trouble. And that's what I took this whole lesson about years ago. If a Christian doesn't stay in the right attitude, they're in trouble. Your altitude is affected by your attitude. Your attitude. So bad attitude, bad flying. You never reach your destination with the wrong attitude. So make sure your attitude stays right so you can always reach your destination safely. Amen. And get it right. So, but we're not going to talk about that. Not that I already didn't. Right. So we're not going to go into all of that. I just want to use that to explain Jesus dealt with attitudes and he's dealing with an attitude blessed and being and having the right heart because he's dealing with these spiritual self-righteous people we call Pharisees. There's another group of Another group that was not Pharisees, they were called Sadducees. You know why? Because they're always sad, you see. They never had the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if you're not fair, you're sad. So you see, thank you, Shannon, for finishing that up. So here we go. Verse one, and seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, he was on the mountain there, the Mount of what they called a Mount of Beatitudes. I had the privilege to stand there in Israel, just on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where the Mount of Beatitudes are, as uh, we stood there and we read the Beatitudes. And uh, we, we heard, when I, when I read these, I picture myself on what they call the, on the Mount of Beatitudes. I can still see where I was standing overlooking the great Sea of Galilee. So there he is in this setting. He opened his mouth and he began to teach saying, blessed are empowered are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, you got to understand his audience. He's not just reading it to you. You got to understand his audience as he had then. And he's talking about blessed are empowered are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So apparently if he's preaching something, you know that he needs for them to understand it. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek not the weak, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, if you already think you're self-righteous, you'll never hunger and thirst for it. If you think you're perfect, you'll never strive to get things right. If you're never wrong, you'll never feel like you have to apologize. If you're never wrong, you never feel like you have to repent. If you always feel like it's some, somebody else's fault, you never feel the need to say, I'm sorry. See, our emotions and how we handle things are very key. So if you always feel like you are the righteous one in a situation, then you'll look around and say, well, I don't need to say I'm sorry. I don't need to say, I don't need to repent because I, I'm, I'm, I'm righteous. Look at me. And he's dealing with things like this with his audience. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, right standing with God, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Oh, okay, stop right here. Merciful. What, what, what is mercy? What is mercy? Mercy is when you're granted something that you don't deserve. People say, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's right, because God is good and mercy follows me because there's times we know we don't do right, but God still shows up and gives us good things anyway. Amen. He doesn't bless me because I'm good. He blesses me because I'm a son and because he knows my heart. And sometimes my actions are not always right, but my heart is right. And always listen, never forget this, even though I've said it many, many times. Even though you do things and say things, and it may be wrong, 
God will still rescue your life if your heart stays pure in it. I may make a wrong decision, but out of a right heart is when you make stupid decisions out of a wrong heart. That's when you are in trouble, my friend. God judges us after the heart. He judges us after the heart. Thank God that he sees our heart, not just our head. Amen. You ever seen people mixed up in their head, even though you know their heart was right? I was talking to someone the other day and I told Angel, I said, you know, the, the thing about it is their heart's right. They're just, they're just confused. But their heart's really right. Their heart's really right. So blessed are, blessed are they, uh, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. So if you're merciful, you shall obtain mercy. You know, if you show love, you know what you're going to reap? Love. If you show kindness and generosity, you know what you're going to reap? Kindness and generosity. If you sow selfishness, you know what you're going to reap? Selfishness. Bitterness reaps bitterness. Everything produces after its own kind. That's just a law. You can't get around it. You sow love, you get love. You sow honor, you receive honor. You sow money, God blesses you. You sow strife, and you take in poison. It's a simple process. It's not, you know, these things written in red are not rocket science. It's just pure from God. So mercy is, we talk about mercy and grace. So what is grace? Grace is help from heaven. Grace is heaven's help. Grace is heaven's empowerment. Wherefore, he give us more grace to the humble and he resists the proud. Well, he is grace. Grace is heaven's empowerment. So if you have the grace of God on you, we need the grace of God. We have the empowerment of heaven to help us. Now, when you're, this is an example I've used, you know how like, you know, maybe you're not used to the terminology, but uh, I grew up with it. My dad used it. Uh, I think more people are familiar with it than, um, than uh, I may give credit for. But, you know, you walk through the house and you trip. My dad would say, hey, Grace. Because in essence, it's like if you were graceful, you wouldn't trip. You know, I've been out in a deer stand and deer hunted and a deer's walked up and I couldn't even hear him. I couldn't even hear it because the way they move through that woods is so graceful. They're not tripping over branches and I mean, they're graceful. That means everything is good. Now, when the grace of God is upon you, Paul said, I do what I do by the grace of God and the grace of God upon you. Everything you do looks easy. When the grace of God's not upon you, <laughs> it doesn't look easy, nor does it feel right because the grace of God's not there. Now, grace is just, I mean, somebody could try to trip you and you jump right over them because you're grace to do what you're doing. Now, mercy is opposite. Mercy, it is when you mess up and the person you messed up with deserves to get the paddle out and just wear that backside up. But instead of saying, bend over, grab your ankles type deal, it says, stand up and let me hug your neck. You deserve the paddling or whatever word you want to use. You deserve the spanking. You deserve the rebuke. You deserve the whipping. Depends on which side the river you're on. You deserved it. But mercy said, I'm going to love you as if you never made the mistake. That's mercy. We all deserved hell. But mercy built a bridge between us and God for us to cross over into eternal life. That's mercy. Amen. That's the mercy of God. So when you're merciful with others, you know what you reap? Mercy. When you don't show mercy, people won't show you mercy. It's all right when you're on the other end not showing mercy, but it's not so much fun when you're not receiving mercy. I should, I should have got a real big amen on that because we've all, there's not a person here that hasn't needed mercy. Amen. amen. Thank God for mercy. I'm just trying to read these verses. You keep getting me preaching. Stop it. Blessed are the pure in heart. That's my favorite one of all of them. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
well, if my heart's not pure, I won't go to heaven. It does. It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about seeing God. You need to see God's ways of doing things. People said, I just can't see God in this. I can't see how God's going to do this. I can't see how God's going to bring me through. I just don't understand how God operates. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. My statement I've made for decades, the purer the heart, the clearer the spiritual vision. If your heart stays pure, You'll see God like you've never seen God before. What does the enemy want to do? Attack your heart. Poison your, corrupt it. But if the heart stays pure, you're able to see God. You're able to see God's ways of doing things. Blessed are the peacemakers. Take note, take note. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. Now, the Pharisees were not very good at these things. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you, when you're reviled and and persecute you, when they revile you and persecute, persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. So, you know, the whole thing is, I can't believe they said that about me. They said it about him. can't believe I was rejected. They rejected him. He said, if they rejected the master, what do you think they're going to do with his followers? If they try to kill the master, what do you think they're going to try to do to you? The same. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, or one, say, one will say savor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it not good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot? We read this the other day. You are the light of the world, a city that sits on a hill that cannot be hid, nor do they light a lamp and put it under, put it under a basket, but on a, on a lampstand or on a candle standing and gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Now, wait a minute. It's not about works. It is somewhat about works. You've got to have good works to go along with your faith. That they may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. Now, I have actually a few more verses to get to my first point here, okay? It all goes with this. Just stay with me. You probably haven't read your Bible today, so just get it. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, he said all this. Now, next thing he said, don't think now. Now, now we're getting to the heart of it. Don't think I came to destroy the law and the prophets. See, the reason why they were thinking that is because he did everything opposite of their thinking, And you know what, Christians today, I'm saying this because we're living in this realm right now because in the the way the world views the church, we are the odd man out. I mean, we're the ones who stands against things that they think are all right. If it wasn't for the Christians, we could do one, two, and three. If it wasn't for the church then we'd be able to keep our liberal agenda. Well, no. They see us as a threat. And you know what I never want to do? Is change their way of thinking. Amen. Because the church is powerful. When I say the church, I'm not talking about local congregations. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Amen. We're not there to, just like Jesus said, we're not here to condemn the world, but through him bring eternal life. See, that's where it all comes in. You Christians are very condemning. I'm not going to condemn anybody, but we're there to bring eternal life. There's a difference. Always watch what the devil fights, because that's what he fears. Always take note. Whatever he fights, that's what he fears. He won't fight what he doesn't fear. What's not a threat to him is not a problem to him. So you got to understand that. So here we go. For surely I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till it is fulfilled. He's dealing with this law now. Who was the keepers of the law? These Pharisees and all the things that goes along with this, okay? Whosoever 
breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever does and teaches, the, who, but whosoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of God. Now he's doing all this teaching. Now watch this. Everybody there respecting the Pharisees and these people, these great spiritual leaders. Now watch this next verse. Now, remember last week, if you were here, if not, you can go back to Spotify or, or, or uh, Apple or wherever it's at to get this. And look what he said in the next verse. For I say unto you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Come on. All of this teaching... They're sitting there saying, done that, done that, done that. That's me, that's me. Not broke one jot, one tittle, that's me. And then he looks over at the ones gathered together. Unless your righteous exceeds them, yeah, you. Would you like to have been there that day? I mean, everybody's there. Amen, amen. You know, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. And, uh, you know, uh, blessed are the peacemaker. That'd be us. Blessed are the pure in heart. That'd be us. Blessed are those who seek God. That'd be us. Amen. That's us. That's not. Oh, we're, oh, praise God. Unless your righteousness exceeds them, not them. <laughs> we're making this the... Pharisee side temporarily. We'll have sad you sees over here in a minute. Okay. Unless your righteousness exceeds, unless, for I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And you know what people's thinking? <gasps> if they will never enter the kingdom of heaven with their brightness, how can we ever make it in? And this is where the teachings of Jesus gets really good. Because it's not the righteousness of the Pharisees. It's the righteousness of God. Come on. I'm starting to enjoy this teaching. It's not the righteousness of the Pharisees. It's the righteousness of God. Let's refresh. What is righteousness, Pastor? Well, one would say... The first definition people give when I say, what is righteousness? What is the first definition? Right standing with God. Well, apparently they were not in right. See, they thought they were the top tier echelon. But he says, they are not the one in right standing. You know what made them want to kill him? Is that kind of preaching. (laughs) You know what made them want to push him off a cliff? Was that kind of preaching. Honestly. 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 It's like this man, the most wicked man in the community. Everybody knew he was wicked. Everybody knew he was wicked. Everybody knew he was wicked. Knew he was a whoremonger. Knew he was a wife beater. He was a cheat in his business. And he dies. Everybody knew it. Nobody talked about it. So his brother shows up, who was wealthy and had a lot of influence, and says, Reverend, I want to make sure that when you do my brother's funeral, you call him a saint. And there'll be a million dollars for you. He said, I can't be bought. There'll be a million dollars for you. The day of the funeral... The man of God got up, said, we're here to pay our last respects to so-and-so. You know in this community who he is. He needs no introduction, even though he's already passed. People that know him have heard stories of him. He beat his wife. He abused his children. He was a whoremonger. He was a woman chaser. And he went on down the line. And his brother sat on the front row like this, I told him. And he says, when he got done, he said, But compared to his brother, he's a saint. (laughs) A million bucks is on the line here now. Come on. 
sometimes people can think they're the ones so right and end up being so wrong. I thank God I don't have to pastor a bunch of Pharisees. Uh, but people started thinking, if their righteousness is not going to get us there, how do we get there? You know, I've heard people say, if that person don't make heaven, who's going to make heaven? How many ever heard people say that about somebody? If that person don't make heaven, then how do we get there? If Scott Robertson don't make heaven, we're all doomed. <laughs> he couldn't preach that on your side. <laughs> I opened the door that night. <laughs> See, some things are just like shooting fish in a barrel. You just. And so you have it here is how in the world, if they don't make, I've watched these people being healed. Somebody dies that was faith people. I've heard it with my own ears. These are not stories. If that person doesn't get healed, then how can I have confidence anybody's going to get healed? Look where they walked. How, look how they walked with God. If they can't get healed, who can get healed? But righteousness, that's that identity that I love. See, I was born again, but my confidence level was nil. I had very nil to none. I mean, it was very little, if I wasn't completely zeroed out, very little confidence. I wasn't confident in how I looked. I wasn't confident how I dressed. I wasn't confident in my, the way I spoke with my stuttering and, and different things that went on. I had such a low self-esteem and confidence level. It was very low. And so I could never see myself doing certain things, but I love God. I love God. Now, I didn't see God the way I, saw, the way I see God now. I saw God as a mad God. Anybody ever seen God as a mad God? That's how you grew up viewing him? I saw God, I view God as mad. Like, I have to, I get messed up and I got to get born again again. I got born again again so many times because I didn't understand what born again meant. So when I tell people I was baptized five times, it's not because I wanted to go under five times. I just didn't know because of the shame of feeling guilty. I'd sat in the back because the pastor of the church that I was in, they operate in the prophetic anointing and I just saw that long finger of, you are going to hell. Yeah, that's how I felt. They wouldn't have done that. Maybe they wouldn't have, but that's how I felt. And uh, I would pray, but I was never confident that God would hear I don't know if I was so confident God wouldn't hear. I just wasn't confident God would answer. Anybody? Ever, come on. Am I all by myself here? Anybody ever been there? I just didn't. I wasn't sure that God would answer. Not that he wouldn't hear as much, but would he answer me? I knew I was born again. I'd get saved again. Get baptized. Get backslide. I don't know what I do to backslide so much. Uh, got born again, again, and got baptized. Backslid again, got born again, again. Now that's, I mean, I'm starting to feel like a cat. I'm going to have nine lives here spiritually. I've been reborn five times now. Come on, that's, you're not, not no one understanding spiritual things. I got reborn again, again. So I got baptized again. I got reborn again, again. And got baptized again. But one day, the light of God's word came in my heart that if I sin, I have an advocate with Jesus Christ the righteous that if I confess my sin, he'll forgive me of my sin and cleanse me and wash me of all unrighteousness. And therefore, if all unrighteousness is washed away, then I'm back in the state of 
righteousness. That's what it was. And I didn't grasp that. Well, nobody taught you that? I don't know. I just didn't grasp it. If they did. It may not have been on the teaching side. You know, everything has, it's not always about the transmitter. A lot of it's got to do with the receiver. So maybe it was transmitted. I just couldn't dial it in. Zero it in. What do you think that was? I don't know. Because I had such a low self-esteem about myself. Maybe. I don't know. But I got it to where I never had to get born again again. Because I realized I was born again. I was already the son of, of God. So righteousness, when I got born again, all these times, I was the righteousness of God. Was I or was I not? The first time I got born again, was I made the righteousness of God? Yes. But could I approach God? Absolutely not. Even though they say I'm right standing with God, I could not approach God. I see, the Pharisees had a totally different concept about this. They couldn't approach God. So that's why when people I know that are not dedicated into prayer, not dedicated to the house of God, not just tendance, but in, in, in attendance, but what you're not saturated with, or let me just put it this way, you're going to be saturated with something because you are created to absorb so now what are you absorbing? That's what it's about. Uh, so just because someone is born again, they'll call you and say, would you pray for me? Now, it's all right for prayer of agreement. That's biblical. I'm not denying that. Would you, would you pray? Not just for me. Would, would you pray? And I start asking people, well, why don't you pray? Well, I know God will hear you. Now, that puts up a red flag real quick. Why won't God hear you? Are you bored again? Oh, yes. But you have a closer contact with him. What is this? Some spiritual fiber connection between me and God? I don't have to go through some other switch. It's just direct to heaven or what? No. You know what they're telling me is? I'm not confident that I can approach God. And if I can't approach God, I'm not confident God will listen to me because I'm not really perfect. You're perfect, Pastor. Uh, let's fix that right now. Let's eliminate that false thing right now. I'm not perfect. I'm redeemed. I'm maturing and being sanctified daily. But one day I'm going to be completely matured when I'm changed from this mortal to this immortality. Until that time, we all got to walk this thing out by faith. You get it? Got to walk it out by faith. So what is righteousness? If it was just right standing with God, nobody would have a problem. But it's not just right standing with God. When, pe when I hear people make statements like, well, you know, uh, God knows me. And, and it's almost like I'm good enough to do it on my own. That's a bad place to be. But righteousness, true biblical, true biblical righteousness is simply this. It's the ability, the ability to stand or to approach God or to stand in the presence of God without the sense of guilt, shame, or inferior, or being inferior, or inferiority. The inferiority problem. So I was inferior this is the confidence that we can come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy. Well, just because I was born again, I didn't have that confidence to approach God boldly. Even though I was the righteousness of God. I, I was righteous, but I had no revelation of righteousness. It's the revelation of it, not the knowledge of it. Knowledge doesn't get you healed. Revelation will. Revelation knowledge will get you healed. Revelation knowledge is what gets you free. So as the righteousness of God, I can now stand in the presence of God without the sense of guilt. The devil can say, don't you remember how you used to live or what you did? No, that's, that man's dead and buried. 
I stand as a righteous of God without the sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. I am no longer a sinner. I am now the righteousness of God. Not by my works, but by his works who died and gave his blood to redeem me. We're saved by grace, not by our own works, lest we have the ability to boast or brag ourselves. But it was the work of God. It's the goodness of God. So now he who knew no sin, Jesus, took my sin that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So now you got people listening to this eloquent sermon that Jesus preached. And he looks and says, now, hear ye, hear ye. In closing, whatever that means for preachers. <laughs> in closing, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of these Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. <gasps> I can't believe he said that. <laughs> I can't believe he said that. Well, he did. And you know what he did? He meant it. Not to shame them, but to show them that God sent another way for them to be free. I love the teachings and the doctrines of Jesus. I love what, what he did and what he stood for. And so, so, you know, the Pharisees were teaching that he came to destroy the law. You know, the law is where we're at. I mentioned this last week, some of these same verses here. If you break one law, you broke them all. If you lied, it's no different than committing idolatry or adultery. You break one law, you broke them all. Somebody said one day, isn't that right, Pastor? You know, they're trying to be spiritual talking to people. You know, we're sitting there, three or four of us. If you break one law, you broke them all. Right, Pastor? You know, unless you're really confident, I probably wouldn't say, right, Pastor? Because he may have to answer. I said, you're right. If you're under the law. But I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. I'm under the goodness of God. Amen? That's exactly right. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. So if I break one, I haven't broke them all. Because I'm held to one law, and that is the law of love. He said, a new commandment I give unto you. All of you fairs, you keep those commandments. You keep those laws. You're not, it's not working for you. How's it working for you? It's not working for you. A new commandment I give unto you. And that is love. He said, what, 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 what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. And the second to this is what? Love thy neighbor as thyself. He said, on these two commandments hang all the prophets and the law. What? Love. On these two commandments hang all the prophets and the laws. So uh, let's go to chapter, uh, Matthew chapter seven. Let's jump over a couple. Can you handle a little more Bible? Is this getting, helping you at all? <clears throat> verse 24. Now, if I was a good pastor, I'd read verses 1 through 23 first. But <laughs> I won't be so good to you for right this minute. Let me be a little less good and just go right to verse 24, okay? Therefore, when you see therefore, you're supposed to stop and see what? Why it's there for. Thank you. Therefore, whosoever hears. Say, I'm a whosoever. Whosoever hears these sayings of mine. Everyone included. And does them. There's your works. And does them. I will liken them unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Now, you'd have to go back, jump over to chapter 13 and really see this rock message. But we won't get there tonight. I promise you that. And the rains descended, the floods came up, the winds blew and beat on the house and it did not fall because it was founded upon a rock. Let's call rock truth. Let's call rock revelation. Whatever, it's not information that stabilizes you, it's revelation, okay? So we understand that. You, under, you, you got the doctrine of that down over the years. It's founded upon a rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does them not. So here we go, one church service. 
we uh, divide, this is a little lopsided here tonight. Let's divide it right down the middle, right from this camera. Praise God, everyone that's streaming tonight, thank you. Right down this camera, everyone on this side and everyone on this side. So since I started on this side, let me start on this side. Those who hear and do is like a man who builds his house up on the rock. Say with me, hearing and doing equals revelation. You can't just hear, you got to act on it before it becomes real. So all of you heard one way. I'm preaching the message. One preacher, one message, one congregation. This side of the congregation heard what I said and didn't only say amen, but did it. This side said amen, but went out and didn't do anything. Same church service, same message. You know, it's true. I heard this man say this a long time ago, but it didn't make sense until it actually happened to me. I, had, I preached one, it's been happening more than once, but one service I preached and somebody sitting about four rows from the back got offended. They're still not here. That says, I can't believe that you told the whole church what my problem was. <laughs> I did? Well, that's supernatural because I don't know your problem. And got offended over the message. That same message, someone said, Pastor, you really helped me. That message, they set me free. I said, isn't that amazing? One message killed one and brought life to another. I, I just don't get it. I mean, could you imagine somebody giving you so much credit that I can tell your whole problem to everybody without mentioning your name? That's pretty good. That's a lot of skill when you didn't even know their whole problems to begin with. But somehow a deceptive spirit, while I was teaching that Lion spirit was teaching them. The Holy Spirit was teaching one way, but they yielded to a lion spirit that was teaching them another way. Well, they never recovered from that. I don't, I never, I mean, I would never. I mean, I wouldn't even, if I'd have looked back in Psalm and thought, they're going to think I'm talking about them, I'd have figured out a way to say something. But not one time did I consider that I would think. I don't know how many times, maybe some of you, that, that spirit tried to say, now he's really, talking, he's really talking about you. It happens. But it don't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean it's true. So, same service. One group of people heard and did. The other group of people heard and did nothing. Same storm. Same message, same Congregation, same storm. Same storm hit the same congregation of people. Are you following me? And the rains ascended, the storm came, the floods came, the winds blew and beat up on the house, and it didn't, and it, it beat up on the house and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So one group of people stood and the other group of people fell. I, I would love to be able to preach one message and everybody gets the same life out of it and face the same storm and winds the same way. That's the way it ought to be, shouldn't it? Now watch this. Verse 28. These are some of my favorite verses. I remember when I first read these, had to be 30 some years ago, something happened to me supernatural. And these verses next I'm going to read. These next verses. And so it was, and so it was, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings, which was written in red, that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, go back to what I said. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. <coughs> scribes and Pharisees. See, that's what made him mad. And then he gets up and preaches. He said, he preaches like one really having authority, not like the scribes. Now, that would make you really feel good. That would be like somebody, I let somebody else preach, and somebody gets up and closes it out and said, well, I'm telling you why that's a good message. He preaches like he's anointed, not like pastor. <laughs> That would be a hard way to close out, wouldn't it? 
And so he gets done preaching and the audience is a mixed crowd. And they say, man, he, he talks like one having authority, not like our preachers, not like our scribes. You know why they wanted to kill him? Yeah. Preaching like that. See, when you read stuff like this, you got to understand, you got to put yourself in the midst of it. And then that wasn't enough. If that's not enough to tick them off, he violates even more of their religious, their religiousosity. And that is doing something on the Sabbath day. We started there last week, and we're going to end with it this week. So go with me back to Luke chapter 13. Back to Luke chapter 13. I love the Bible. Love it. And the more, the more, you, the more it makes sense to you, the more you're going to love it. Now, he's teaching. Now, you know, you got to understand, <clears throat> here's how I see it. Jesus gets the scroll again. He stands up to teach. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, scribes, the Pharisees, the scribes especially, are sitting there going, I know what the people are thinking. That he teaches with more authority than what we are. He ain't even started reading yet. And they're thinking, I know what they're thinking already. This man teaches with more power than us. They like him more than us. Don't they realize who we are? No. The light of God's words coming in to, re- to show who he is. And so they're already shook about this. And so here we go. Chapter 13, verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. Yes, where you should teach. Sabbath day. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could no wise raise herself up. And when she saw Jesus, when Jesus saw her, both, they connected here, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. He didn't just say it. He laid his hands on her and immediately she had made, she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with excitement and glee. Thank God one of my members just got healed. Huh? That's not what happened? And the ruler of the synagogue, let's say the pastor, the leader of the church, answered with indignation. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. He wasn't so much on the Sabbath day. You know why they're mad? Because he did something they couldn't do. He did something they couldn't do. He did something they never could do. Everything he did was opposite what they were able to do. Because their righteousness was of their self. They knew not the Father. When you're connected to the right source, you get the right result. You get the right result. Filled with indignation. And said to the crowd, now, it's nothing like preaching a message. Somebody gets up and re-preaches a message after you. Especially the one that doesn't compliment the message you just preached. (laughs) So Jesus gets up. He just does preaches. He pre-taught first. There's a lady, 18 years, bowed over, could not raise herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to himself and said, woman, thou art loose from your infirmity. And immediately she stood up straight and glorified God. <laughs> the pastor, indignation, sat there. So Jesus, like, I believe, Luke chapter 4, where he closed the book, sat back down. The ruler of the synagogue got back up. His turn. Now, everybody, I want you to know, out of six days, this man had to do this. He had to wait to the Sabbath day. Yeah, we're here every week. Why why haven't you done this? Six days, he was here to preach and to heal, and he hasn't done it. So Jesus got up and said, all right, my turn again. Hypocrite. Tag team preaching, but in the wrong message, no way in it. 
the Lord then answered and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath day lose his ox or donkey from the stall to lead it away to water it? Ought not this woman, being the daughter of Abraham, the righteousness, the one that, that, uh, that we know to be a true daughter, whom Satan has bound, think of it for 18 years. Be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude glory rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Him, the one that says, well, you scribes can't hold a candle to this man preaching. Unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom. I'm telling you what, this was a religious war. But it wasn't Jesus against them. It was all of them against God's new system. There was a revolution of God's new system. And I'm telling you what, I thank God he never quit. That he kept preaching it. He kept demonstrating it. He kept healing it. So that we can stand here today in the truth and the reality of how good our God is. We don't make it because of the righteousness of someone else. We make it because of the righteousness of God. He didn't come to destroy anything. He came to give it total life. He was the fulfillment of it. Thank God that he cared enough about his people to fulfill everything that he started. Amen. I, I'm gonna, I just want to pause here. Uh, last week I had to cut myself a little bit short. I want you to stand with me. Didn't have as many announcements. Got started a little bit earlier. <clears throat> a few minutes ago when I was sharing about confidence and approaching God, I really believe that's a major issue with people. How they approach God. A lot of people don't pray because they struggle approaching God. They don't feel God hears or God will do. I don't want to pray for that person. What if they don't get healed? Well, what if you pray and they do get healed? Here's one. It's a, this is a famous statement. Go lay hands on that person over there. That they hear that. Go lay hands. <laughs> and then uh, they come and tell somebody, said, I really felt in uh, Walmart to go lay hands on that lady in her pajamas over there. Oh, that could have been anybody, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I felt to go lay hands on that person they were bowed over. What well, did you do it? No. I didn't know if it was just, I, I, I didn't know if, if, if it was just me or God. Now let's fix that. Are you the kind of person just go over and start laying hands on people in the middle of Walmart while somebody's in their pajamas? No. If that's not your nature and your character, then it'd be easy to decipher between you and maybe the Lord leading you to go do it. You understand? It'd be easy to decide that. And I realize that you're the one who has to go do it. You've got to take your feet and walk over there and say, hey, excuse me. When I walk past you, you may not understand this, but the Spirit of God dealt with me to pray for you. Can I pray for you? A lot of times they'll say, I I've been believing for somebody to pray for me. And bam. The worst thing can happen is you miss God. And God still judge you because your heart's right. Now, people that's, that's always ready to go pull somebody out of a chair and say, hey, God said, said, you know, I, I believe that, I don't believe Jesus prayed for everybody. I believe, well, you mean he didn't pray for everybody. He went to the pool of Bethesda, full, five porches full of sick folks. Five porches full of sick folks. And only, it only records him going to one person out of, out of the whole porches. 
Well, why don't you think he prayed for everybody? Because he said this, I do what I see the Father do. I say what I see the Father say. Sometime whole multitudes got healed. But it doesn't say that he prayed for everybody. One verse in, in Mark says, and he was at the door and they brought in him all that were sick and he healed many. Somebody said, and he healed, he saw the multitude and healed them all. But this one he said, they brought all the sick and he healed many. Well, that means he prayed for some that didn't get healed. No, it doesn't mean he prayed for some that didn't get healed. That means maybe he didn't pray for all of them. I'm just saying, read, read your Bible. And they brought all, and he healed many and cast out many devils. You know, there's times people have called me to go pray for somebody, and all the way there, and I laid hands on them, I felt no anointing at all to pray for them. I don't know why. I don't know if they've already rejected them on the inside or what. But I love to feel a supernatural anointing every time I pray for somebody. But there's times I didn't feel that. But I'm open to God and willing to do whatever he tells me to do. There's times I have uh, tried to bargain a better deal. <laughs> but I've done it. And that's the way it is. So I just want us to have confidence here. Just, I want you to just close yourself off when I say close your eyes. Nothing spiritual about closing your eyes. The Bible says you can watch and pray. So there's nothing wrong with praying with your eyes open. But I want you to just close yourself off a minute. God wants to restore confidence in you. Restore confidence. And to restore confidence, you have to see yourself as the righteous of God. Just because you're born again, you don't always see yourself standing in that position without a sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. Well, can you anoint me with oil and lay hands on me to help me? No. No, 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 no. Laying on of hands is good for some things, but it's not good for everything. Anointing of oil is good for some things, but not for everything. I can anoint a sinner with oil and lay hands on him. It doesn't mean he's going to get born again. Until he believes in his heart, confesses with his mouth the Lord Jesus, then he'll be saved. You understand what I'm saying? Laying on of hands doesn't, doesn't fix everything. But I want you to look on, the, I want you to look on your inside. Look, look inside, the, your heart, your spiritual heart. And I want you to be honest with yourself. Where are you at with your confidence to approach God? Where are you at? And I'm gonna, now I'm going to pray. And I want you to pray. I want to pray a pattern. But you hear me praying and you adjust it to your own situation. The only way I can tell you, you adjust it to your own situation. So Father, I thank you tonight. I stand before you. I thank you for being my Father. Jesus, I thank you for being my redeemer. Father, it's my desire to approach you without the sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. Lord, now I pray. I pray and I'm asking you right now to reveal yourself in a way to your people like you've never revealed yourself. Father, may insecurities flee and may their hearts be open to know they can approach you, not only call you Father, but knowing that you're going to call them sons and daughters and knowing that you're going to use them and empower them. Lord, we love you and we honor you. Forgive us where we missed it. Restore us into that perfect place, that good place, in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, I thank you as the elders come tonight. For anybody that wants prayer after this, I thank you that no sickness, no plague, no disaster, no destruction, nor disease shall come near us. For you give your angels charge over us. And therefore, we say, according to Psalms 91, angels take charge. Amen.